The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Who would have thought of this type of concept that God would be considered a fool or be considered weak? But this is how man discerns the situation. Carnal man, carnal understanding doesn't understand the things of God. So unto the wisdom of this world, God, God's ways are foolishness. And unto the strong people of this world, God's ways are weak. And we see evidence of this when we look at things according to our natural mind. Many times we say, what is God doing? How is it that this is going to work out for good? How will these seemingly bad things, difficult situations, tri tribulation, trials, uh, all manner of evil things we, we, we would consider to be evil. How could these be used unto good? And yet that is our promise, according to the word of God, that all things, even those things that we consider to be bad, evil, destructive, will be used for God's purposes unto good. God is good. All that he does ends in goodness and has a purpose in it. The purpose is for the love of God to be displayed, for his wisdom to be seen, for his great strength. We can trust in him because we know his love. We know his wisdom. We know his strength. And yet, to the natural understanding, the things of God seem to be foolishness. Many times, the things of God seem to be weak, not strong, not wise, not, not as we see the things of this world, very wise, very... Uh, prosperous, rich, great. You look at men's systems, men's organization, men's uh, corporate structure, governments, the wealth of understanding and knowledge. When we look out at uh, the progress of science and technology and we say, wow, great wisdom, great understanding, great strength. And then you consider those things in contrast to God's ways. And people would say, wow, God looks uh, foolish. God looks weak in comparison to men's wisdom and men's strength. Well, that's the carnal understanding. That's the carnal mind. But thank God he has given us the spirit of the son, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can proclaim the truth of God, even if it looks like foolishness, even if it looks like weakness, God will cause his ways to be seen and they will be seen in the end, as much greater than the so-called wisdom of men, the so-called strength of men. We're pulling this, this idea right out of the scripture where we're going through 1 Corinthians, Paul with the wisdom that God had given him, coming out of that religious system of his age, of his day, where he was a very learned and talented man in the religion of the Pharisees, he was a Pharisee of, a Phar of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, had been under one of the greatest teachers of his day, and yet all of that was counted as nothing unto him, that he might receive the knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom, the power, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man gave himself for the world, gave himself as a sacrifice suffered and died at the hands of evil and cruel men so that he might save the world. Well, that in itself, from the natural perspective, seems to be foolishness. And so Paul writes here where we're at, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, and that's Paul here speaking, as, he's writing as a man, in, in a man's perspective, human perspective. The world through wisdom did not know God. Think of it. Think of the scientists of our day. If they just go based on just science alone, or if the great learned philosophers just go based on philosophy alone, or any other way of men's understanding, will not lead you unto God. God's ways are unsearchable, and it requires faith that comes by grace. So the world through wisdom did not know God. Therefore, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And the message is the message of the cross, the cross where Jesus died. That is the message that Paul 
is preaching. That is the emphasis of his message right now is on the cross of Christ because we're looking at the middle wall of partition, the, the, the place of separation among the body being dissolved. How is it dissolved? How is it taken away? By the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the message, Paul says, that we preach. And this message is considered foolishness, but it's preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This excites me because the Lord, in his great wisdom, has hidden the truth from the so-called wise and prudent of this age. And then he reveals it unto those who just hunger and thirst after righteousness, that just desire the truth as a child desires the truth and just asks in humility and meekness to their parents. They say, Dad, Mom, what does this mean? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with humbling yourself and asking. As a matter of fact, there's a promise that God has given that if we ask, we will receive. If we knock, the door will be open unto us. If we seek, we're going to find. I'm not putting those in the perfect order. But the, the, the point that I'm making is God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we must first believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. And we have to seek after him in humility. We don't know all things. God has hidden these things. He takes great pleasure in hiding the truth of the spirit from carnal individuals so that they can't get their hands on it and use the glory of God for their own ends to glorify flesh to bring greater evil on the earth because there's great power there's great wisdom in the things of god but god isn't going to allow man to take those things and corrupt them they, they are to a certain extent able to do so but he's hiding the most powerful and great riches of god reserved for those who humble themselves under the mighty hand of god that they might be exalted with the true knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And here is the knowledge of God. Seems to be foolishness, but it is power. Seems to be weakness, but it is great strength. L let's look at the scripture. A few places we would consider just to be foolishness, and I'm going to stick with just mostly all just what Jesus himself, now this is God in human flesh, what Jesus himself taught his disciples. Luke 6, 27, he told his disciples, I say to you, who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully or who spitefully use you. Now that right there is foolishness to the natural man. Who goes out and says, you know what? I think I'm going to love those who hurt me today. I think I'm going to bless those who curse me. That is foolishness with the natural man. No, no. It's natural and wise to defend yourself. That's what parents teach their children. You have to defend yourself so that you're not bullied. You have to defend yourself so you're not taken advantage of. It's foolishness to let somebody just pound on you. But what people aren't understanding is if your trust is in the Lord and you're leaning heavily upon God, he will be your protection. You don't have to worry about somebody getting the best of you because you have God on your side through the spirit of the Lord, and he will become your hedge of protection. He will be your defense and your shield. But that's foolishness to man. Why? Why is it foolishness? Because you're depending on an unseen and unheard entity, not flesh and blood, not natural, not carnal, but spiritual. And natural man cannot discern the things of the spirit. So they're foolishness to him. But to us who know the truth through the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that this is a great blessing to be able to bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. 
And Jesus says in verse 29, To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. In other words, if they take one piece of clothing, give them the other one. Give to everyone who asks is a of you and from him who takes away your goods do not ask them back and just as you want men to do to you you also do to them likewise but if you love those who love you what credit is that to you even sinners love those who love them and if you do good to those who do good to you what credit is that to you for even sinners do the same and if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Wow, love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. So look at this. Jesus is saying this is the attribute of God. This isn't, this isn't man's way. This is God's ways. And yes, to man, it's considered foolishness. Jesus is saying, don't defend yourself. Let, let people take advantage of you. God will defend you. God will help you. God will repay you. Don't worry about keeping your goods back from people that are considered your enemies, but instead give them what they want and don't worry about getting anything back from them. God will reward you because God is this way. He gives to those that are unthankful. He gives to those that are evil. Think the scripture that says the rain falls on the just and the unjust, that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Rain is good. It's needed. Rain is a picture of uh, provision for your sustenance. If you have rain, then you have food because rain will become the water that feeds the crops and allows you to get nourishment. So if God allows rain, the rain to fall on the just, the good people and the unjust, the evil, that means he's taking care of both the good and the evil. Those who acknowledge him and know him and those that don't know him or even hate him. He's good to both. That seems foolishness. A good God. I thought that he was good to the good and evil to the evil. Not necessarily. God is good, as they say, all the time. He's good to those that love him and those that hate him. And we see this in the Lord Jesus Christ over and over and over again. He didn't curse his persecutors. He didn't call down fire on heaven, from heaven on them. He could have easily. He didn't call for the angels to come and defend him. He allowed himself to go through the suffering of the cross because he knew that the victory was through death and the resurrection from the dead. And the love of God would be displayed through that act of mercy. And it was mercy. It was God's mercy. God didn't repay evil to evil. Now, it's true that uh, great tribulation came upon Jerusalem and the temple, and everything was destroyed in 70 AD. Okay, but that wasn't because they crucified the Lord Jesus. God had ordained it to be so. God ordains the good and the evil. He uses both for his purposes. Praise be unto God. So how can the potter say, or how can the clay say to the potter, why have you made me this way? Doesn't the potter have power over one vessel to make unto good and honor and one to make unto evil and dishonor? God is just and he is good to both the good and the thankful and the evil and the unthankful. And so he has called us to have that same nature and character because through that, God is winning the world unto himself that they might know him as their loving father. And I know that there's many that would hear this and say, well, this is, I already agree, it's foolishness. But that's exactly what's written here. The foolishness of God, the foolishness of God, Paul wrote, is wiser than man. And the weakness of God, well, these are the things that pertain to the foolishness and the weakness of God. Look again, Jesus is teaching, Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just think about that from the natural perspective. Who, who would be considered blessed or a blessed person who's poor? From the natural perspective, they're not considered blessed. They're considered cursed. 
The poor of the, of the earth are considered cursed, but Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Again, that does not seem to be a position of blessing. That is, that's when you lose something, is when you mourn. And yet Jesus said, Blessed are the, those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Again, hungering and thirsting does not seem to be a blessed position in the natural. If you're hungry and thirsty, that means you don't have enough. But Jesus said it's blessed and you're going to be filled. And I know he's speaking about spiritual things that apply spiritually. But this is the truth of God that is considered foolishness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And here's the one that really gets people. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. That means when you do something good, evil comes. No one considers that to be a blessing. No one says, well, I was blessed today because I went and helped somebody and they turned around and slapped me in the face and said, get away from me. No one rejoices in that naturally. You consider that to be evil, a curse, terrible. I tried to help somebody out of the goodness of my heart and they turned around and rebuked me for it. I did what was right and evil came. Does that happen? That happens. And God is the one who always is doing good and yet he receives evil in return. We see in the Lord Jesus Christ, the display of that especially is the very message of the cross that God came in Jesus to reconcile the world unto himself and they hated him for it and they cursed him and they mocked him and they made him out to be a devil. But Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Blessed are you. That doesn't seem like a blessed position. That seems foolishness to man, foolishness to me. From the natural, if I speak as a man, that seems like utter foolishness. But the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. Because this is how God draws people unto himself. The foolishness of the cross is, Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth and he's speaking of the cross, I'll draw all men unto me. It's the love of God, the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. It's the preaching of the cross of Christ. And yes, it includes the resurrection of the dead. But to have the resurrection of the dead, you have to have the cross. You have to preach the cross. And it's foolishness to men. And it's weakness to men. Again, Jesus speaking, Matthew 5, 38, he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. In other words, once again, just do good. Overcome evil with good. Just do good to people. They they treat you evil, treat them good anyway. They curse you, bless them. Amen. This is the attribute, the nature of the attributes of God that are shown in the fruit of the Spirit. Goodness, mercy, peace, righteousness, kindness, forgiveness. On and on it goes. All of this, it, it flows from the new nature of God out of a people who have been conformed or are being conformed to his image through the Spirit, through the indwelling life of the Spirit of God. Our allegiance is to Jesus, to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We see in him the perfect man, and so we desire to be as he he is. Is it foolishness to the carnal mind? It's foolishness. Does the natural mind resist the things of God? Yes, yes, it does. Again, this is being repeated again, Matthew 5, 43, Jesus teaching this same concept. Once again, that would be considered foolishness, the foolishness of God. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that's what's normal in the world. You do. You love those who love you and you hate those who hate you. But I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, 
and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. There, that's the scripture that we quoted from. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're, we're having to measure up to the standard of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. And in our natural state, we resist that wisdom. We resist that power. And again, we call it foolishness. We call it weakness. But as we come to know the Lord by the Spirit, as we come unto Jesus and say, teach me, Lord, of your ways, he shows us the great wisdom of Christ, the great power of God that is found in this cross that we take up. We take up our cross and we follow him. And in our natural state, it's common to all of us. We resist it because there's something in us that wants to defend ourselves. We want to defend ourselves, but we have to remember the Lamb of Calvary who when he was accused, he was like a dumb lamb. Dumb meaning he wouldn't defend himself. He wouldn't speak to try to fight his own battle there. But rather he was going to allow the evil that was done to cause greater good to increase in the earth. Mm. Wisdom, power, not of men. But of God, Jesus again, John 10, Jesus says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that more that they have may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, when Jesus says this, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We could have in our mind an image of the shepherd, uh, you know, saving the sheep by fighting off the wolves that come to devour the sheep. And truly, the Lord does that. But how is his? how does he do it? In what way does he do it? It says he gives his life for the sheep. I don't think anybody immediately understands how the life of the Lord is wrought in us. It isn't wrought in us by him necessarily just fighting off all of the wolves. It is through the cross that we have victory, through the cross. Amen. It's literally laying down your life and allowing evil to come. That seems counterproductive to the natural mind, but it is the way of God. It is the way of God because he raises the dead. If there was no resurrection from the dead, then yes, it would be a lost cause, but the whole basis is upon the resurrection of the dead and the fact that you cannot destroy the life of God. The life of God in Jesus Christ raised him from the dead. And that same life of the Lord will quicken these mortal bodies, will cause us to live. If we're wounded, it will bring even greater health after the wounding. Praise be unto God. This is not a way that doesn't bring some grief and some heartache and some difficulty. But the promise is, as though we will have tribulation in the world, we're not to be afraid because he has overcome the world. So he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and they will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Now, when he says he's laying down his life, he's talking about the cross. No one takes it from me. 
I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Again, Jesus speaking of these things. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He was telling them of the cross and, of course, that he was going to be resurrected. But just the thought of Jesus dying at the hands of evil men was more than Peter could take. So then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this shall happen. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And here is the mystery. The mystery is that this is how Jesus saves the sheep. Not by fighting off the enemy in a physical sense. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for a king of the kingdom of Israel, of Judea, that was going to come and get rid of the Romans. Fight off all the sinners, all the heathen nations that were trying to infringe or or encroach, become Uh, enemies that were going to take over the land that God had given to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, to Israel. But Jesus wasn't going to fight in that way. That was not the method, method of God, not from the very beginning. The method is a mystery. The method is the cross, the cross of Christ. And just as Jesus took up his cross, so we have to each of us take up our own cross and follow the Lord and lay down our lives just as he showed us, lay down our lives. This is how the world is one unto God. John 12, 23. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That's the wisdom of of God. That's the power of God. It's wiser than men. Jesus said, you're going, you're going to see me die. I'm going to die the death of a murderer. I'm going to die an excruciating, terrible, wicked death, but I will raise again and I will raise again in the hearts of you all, of my followers, of my disciples. And that word is going to increase as each one lays down their life for another. That's why he says in verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. This is the honor of the king to serve creation. He didn't come to be served by his servants. He came to serve as a servant, to serve creation by love. This is the greatest love. John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And this is the commandment for all of us, to love one another, to lay down our lives for one another. Does it look like foolishness to the flesh? Yes, it does. Does it look like weakness to the flesh? Yes, it does. Do we get to defend ourselves? No. God will be our defense. God will raise us from the dead. If we suffer wrong, God will cause the angels of the Lord to minister to us and to lift us up that we might continue on this quest of life and godliness and reconciliation to see people come out of the darkness of the kingdoms of this world into the life and the liberty and the light of the kingdom of God. We are ministers of the kingdom of God through the cross of Christ. This is the power of God. This is the wisdom of God. And it is stronger than men. It looks like weakness. It looks like failure. It looks like foolishness. But Beloved, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men.